What's going on YouTube? It's Teej back again with another video and today we are closing out my second to last mock draft before we get to the real beginning of the NFL draft. Man, it's kind of sad to say, but excited to bring this third round video to you and hopefully you guys enjoy. Be sure to hit that like button if you do. Subscribe if you're new to the channel looking for more mock drafts and NFL coverage in general. And be sure to leave your thoughts as we go through round three today down below in the comment section. Who went too high? Who went too low? Who's your favorite team? And did you like the draft haul I gave your squad? Not only here in the third round, but now you can say whether you like the entire top 100 haul that I gave your squad. And of course, I also want to make note of today's sponsor. Definitely check out the description. Bet US has some great offers. Offer some sign-up uh, bonuses. You get a deposit bonus with the first link or a free $50 bet with the second link down below in the description. So definitely check out BetUS. I'm sure you all have heard of them. Definitely go check them out and their offerings down below. But I want to showcase the best players still available on today's uh, on the board in today's video. And I also want to remind everybody, if you're checking this out and you're like, hey, where's round one? Where's round two? It was already up on the channel. Round one was Friday. Round two was yesterday on Saturday. So definitely go back, check those videos out. We had some trades that will shake up the draft order just a little bit if you're confused. Hey, why is my team not picking here? All that sort of stuff. So that will give you your answer. And I highly encourage you to go check those videos out. But now let's go ahead and kick off round three with Carl Brooks going to the Chicago Bears. Leave it to me. Every draft, I'm going to find a way to move Carl Brooks up a little bit more. This might be about the ceiling. Uh, he's going to be 75 on my big board, uh, maybe maybe subject to tweak. But, you know, here at 64, I think he could be that disruptive three tank that the Bears are looking to add. Um, you know, played a whole lot on the edge at Bowling Green, but I think you shift him inside, kind of play him over the B gap, you know, kind of between that two eye and three tank position on either shoulder of the uh, offensive guard across from him and he's got that pass rush juice from the edge can that be applied there on the inside i think it can and i think you saw it at the senior bowl um and also just at the senior bowl seeing him hold up against the run that was the biggest thing because i was like he looks polished as a pass rusher and he looks like he's got that game figured out but like are people just going to throw him to the ground and kind of just abuse him in the run game? But no, he held up and he's north of 300 pounds and feels like it and plays like it. So um, yeah, the Bears are looking for a disruptor and a difference maker. And I think the pass rush upside that Brooks brings to the table, he definitely could be that guy. And a, and a cheap way of adding that position versus like Jalen Carter at nine or trading up to get a Kalijah Kansi or trading back in the first round or early second round to get Addy Tommy Wilde Barra, you know, all that sort of stuff. You can kind of sit, wait, let the draft come to you and the draft car Brooks to start out the third round. Next is Houston, and at 65, I'm going to give him Luke Weipler. I've said a lot of times I think the big three centers, Weipler, Schmitz, and uh, Tittman, go before the end of the second round. Here, Whipler lingers just a little bit longer, and Houston takes him. Uh, this is another one of those teams where you look at their you know starting uh, you know offensive line and center sticks out like a sore thumb, and it's like, yep, you got to find an upgrade there. And the other two teams that have that, we've already addressed it there, with the Giants being one of them, uh, and here, Houston here to start out uh, round three. And actually, I think... We had that for each and every round. Now, hold on. I got to go back. We're going to have a small tangent here at the start of the video. So it was the Giants in round one, and then it was the uh, Seattle Seahawks, I think, at 37. So, yeah, we've been able to give one center per round to different teams that, you know, yeah, their glaring hole is center on the offensive line. So didn't plan it out that way, but it is a happy coincidence all the same. Next up, Arizona at 66. This is where I'm going to have Emmanuel Forbes come off the board. I, again, admittedly, I'm a little bit lower on Forbes because 166 pounds. That's such a huge outlier. I don't know how that's going to play. But that being said, Mississippi State showcases, they run a lot of zone, and you kind of feel that zone, you know, coverage ability in Forbes, and he's got a good feel for it. Uh, and then you look at six foot one, long arms, man, he's got a lot of those traits that make for a good man coverage corner. Uh, and Jonathan Gannon's going to have to rebuild that secondary basically from the ground up. No more Byron Murphy, Buda Baker's requesting a trade. So, you know, take a chance on a guy here in the third round who has that feel for zone coverage, which, you know, Gannon runs a lot of cover for, but also has those man traits that, you know, Gannon also plays a lot of cover one man. Uh, it kind of fits into that as well. So I think he's got the scheme versatility to kind of fit perfectly with what Jonathan Gannon wants to do on that side of the ball. A couple of picks here from Denver at 67. I'm going to go uh, Tyreek Stevenson. He, he's another one of those players where, like, why is he still on the board? But he's also a fantastic fit for Vance Joseph. He wants to run a lot of press man, sprinkle in some zone there with it and blitz a lot. And Tyreek Stevenson, I I think part of the reason he might fall is because he's a high floor guy and then I kind of worry about what the ceiling is thereafter but plug and play starter upgraded with Damari Mathis and he's got that man press game that Vance Joseph is going to covet pair him up with Pastor Tan that's a really awesome duo there on the outside then 68 a name I haven't really talked about in some time I'm going to go with uh Tyler Steen uh from Alabama and this is me projecting him moving to guard um I like his game a whole lot more at guard. I think the measurables match up a little bit better there. Uh, an experienced guy, three-year starter at Vanderbilt, then transfers over to Alabama, holds up at left tackle for the Crimson Tide. So 
battle tested. I think he'll be more than capable of being able to make the move inside. And then it just gives Denver one more option. They have Ben Powers coming in uh, as a big offseason acquisition. And then you have Lloyd Cushenberry and Quinn Miners playing center and right guard, respectively. Steen might ultimately take one of those guard spots, and then Quinn Myers moves over to center if Lloyd Cushenberry doesn't take a step forward. So I'm just trying to find the best combination of five offensive linemen. I think Bulls, McGlinchey, they're going to be your tackles. And then it's like, what trio on the inside looks the best? And I could see a world where it's like powers at left guard, you move Steen over to right guard, and Quinn Myers becomes your center. And that might be a better trio than powers, Cushenberry, and Quinn Myers. But we'll have to wait and see. And it's never bad to have some uh, flexible guard interior offensive linemen depth, uh, especially in the third round, I think it's a decent value for that type of ad. And also a name I haven't talked about in a while. So then we get to the Rams at 69. I'm going to give them Chandler Zavala. So back-to-back interoffensive lineman picks. Uh, but, I mean, did you watch the Rams play last year? Even when they were healthy. Like, do you remember that week one game against the Bills when, uh, yeah, Jordan uh, Phillips was eating the Rams into your offensive lineman alive, like wholesale. And then Von Miller was just obliterating Joe Nopum, but you know, they paid him nothing. I'm going to fix here. Uh, but Chandler Zavala could be a big time upgrade there at left guard. Looks really, really good in pass protection, but also has that Mahler mentality, puts people in the dirt and he does it at 320 pounds while running a 501, you know, 40. That's pretty special athleticism. So ultimately I think he goes round two, but here he's still on the board just long enough for the Rams to get really solid value here at 69. Next is the Raiders at 70. I'm going to give him Isaiah Foskey. You know, I'm just, no guarantee Chandler Jones can be the same guy. And Foskey stay on the board, and this is really, really good value here at 70. Easy could be a second round draft pick uh, and a good fit for that, you know, uh, traditional 4 3 defense for Patrick Graham. Um, and again, no guarantee Chandler Jones is that same guy. Uh, and so Foskey could be the guy opposite of Max Crosby. And even in passing situations, you could move Crosby inside and have Foskey, Chandler Jones, and uh, Max Crosby on the field all at the same time. And I could even see where maybe the way you get a little bit more out of Chandler Jones is by him kind of only playing five to 600 snaps and it's all pass rush work. And then Foskey, you know, it's six foot four, 260, is a smart pass rusher and has a full move set, but doesn't have anything crazy athletic and maybe isn't ready to, because of that, doesn't have that twitchy get off, right? Doesn't have that insane bend that you know is going to win at the next level. Maybe it's a little bit of a slow start for him as a pass rusher. Um, I could see where Foskey maybe is used as the rundowns guy. And then you rotate Chandler Jones in then for passing situations. So a lot of different ways this could break out, but the Raiders need a long-term answer at edge because Chandler Jones is not going to be it. I think this is probably going to end up being his last year in Vegas. So Foskey is a potential Chandler Jones replacement long-term. Next up, New Orleans at 71. I'm going to give up Parker. Washington, this is a fit that I have done plenty of times. Gives you that yak ability that they just don't have right now. Michael Thomas, not really his game. Chris Olave does a lot of things well, but not a yak weapon. I think Parker Washington brings that to the table. While also kind of being that Jarvis Landry, really good route runner underneath, good good hands, can kind of do some fun stuff there. Uh, can work the middle of the field. I think Parker Washington really has the route running to win at all three levels. Uh, so I think you can do a lot of different things with him. But in this offense, it'd probably be working the underneath stuff in the middle of the field. Uh, and then with good contested catch upside, that will play over the middle of the field, right? And uh, yeah, I also think the yak ability here. I, they have Rashid Shahid, but I'd love to have one of their starting three. You know, like those big three wide receivers, Thomas Alave and Parker Washington in this case, be one of those guys they can trust in, you know, the screen game and, you know, just kind of run a zig route, we'll throw it to you and go pick up, a, you know, first down and third and five. You know, that sort of stuff that Jarvis Landry did for them. I think Parker Washington could do the same. Next, Minnesota at 72. This is another one of those picks from the trade down that we had with the Tennessee Titans garnering Minnesota an extra selection. And at 72, I'm going to give him Darius Rush. I think he'd be a fantastic fit for that Brian Flores defense. And I'm finally starting to shrink the, the margin between Cam Smith and Darius Rush. I think I'm going to do it even more in Wednesday's updated mock. Um, but Rush has the arm length, the 40, and the man coverage skill set. We saw it at the Senior Bowl. We saw it at South Carolina. More ball production than Cam Smith. This guy is just a good, ready-to-go NFL corner at the next level. Uh, and now you have competition with Caleb Evans, right? Uh, I think Byron Murphy, let's just say he starts in the slot for, you know, argument's sake. And then Andrew Booth Jr., second rounder last year, you drafted him relatively early, your second pick, actually, uh, just after Lewis Seen. So let's say he's got one of those starting spots. Now it's saying Darius Rush, Caleb Evans, go at it. Whoever wins the job is going to be our starting corner uh, opposite of Booth on the outside. And I, I honestly, I think Darius Rush would win that job, but I was also admittedly not a big Caleb Evans guy. So uh, yeah, I think Darius Rush, really good value here and a really good fit for that man coverage scheme that Brian Flores wants to run. Then we get to Houston and, you know, a couple picks later than I did it last week, but I'm going to go with Gervon Dexter. Played a whole lot of time in the B-gap at Florida, pretty good run defender, but you see the upside really from the pass rush standpoint. And 
really, if he didn't show those flashes of pass rusher, he's probably going even later here in the third round. But because you get those moments, you get those glimpses, and you know he's 6'6", 310, has crazy explosiveness, it's like, okay, someone's going to take a shot on him. And he primarily, like I said, played at the B-gap. Here in Houston, that base 4-3, we're talking about him playing the 2 I to the 3, so on other either shoulder uh, of the guard, which would be a little bit closer to the center than what he did at Florida, but nonetheless... Ultimately, I think he'll be able to make that adjustment. And right now, it's you know it's Ray Lopez and Malik Collins on the inside. And I don't know how great those guys are. And uh, I think Dexter easily has the highest ceiling of those three. So if you take a you know big upside swing of the bat here and uh, Dexter works out, man, that is going to be a huge add for the D'Amico Ryan's interior defensive line where I think, I think they stand to find an upgrade. Next, the Browns at 74. Let's give them Keon White. Uh, and same sort of argument here. It's going to be Keon White. Ogbenai Okoronkwo. That's going to be your edge duo opposite of Miles Garrett. And I even think that kind of works out. Okoronkwo in um, the Rams Super Bowl season 2021, he was solid against the run, but he also only played like 300 snaps. So it's not really a sample size I can trust. Last year, he played almost 600 snaps. Still not huge, but was much more of a pass rush specialist and not great against the run with Houston. So I could see Keon White kind of being the counterbalance to that where, hey, this guy needs to grow as a pass rusher. Let's buy him some time. He'll be our early downs, run downs type of guy. And we'll rotate Okoronkwo in for the passing situation stuff. Um, and then, you know, if Keon White really does continue the progression that he's had from ODU to Georgia Tech, you know, he's only been playing edge for four years for now. Um, you know, if he does take that step forward, you can have all three on the field. And Awesome. That's a great problem to have. Uh, and Okoronkwo is not making insane money to where he needs to be playing every snap of the season either. So on uh, any defensive line help you can have to take weight off the shoulders of Miles Garrett. Not that I don't think he can carry it because that dude is built like a legitimate alien. I think he could carry the earth if he needed to, like real Atlas shit. But um, yeah, if you can take some of that pressure off his shoulders, that would go a long way. Keon White, I don't think is there yet as a pass rusher. More so working the early downs and the Rams, uh, excuse me, the Rams. The, the Browns have been pretty weak against the run over the last couple of years. And I think Keon White's a nice insurance against that. Next up, Atlanta Falcons. It's going to be the same pick as last week, Tyler Scott. Uh, I didn't even think about this when I made the pick, but reuniting Desmond Ritter and Tyler Scott, two former Cincy Bearcats. That's a fun storyline. He's just the skill set at wide receiver they don't have. And don't tell me Scotty Miller because he, he'll, he'll drop that opportunity like he does every other pass. Uh, so Tyler Scott actually has pretty good hands for a guy that's relatively new to the position. Pretty well-rounded route tree. Pretty developed route tree at that matter. Um, for a guy, again, new to playing wide receiver. Tracks the football well. So I, I would just rather have Tyler Scott play that Scotty Miller role than Scotty Miller. Uh, and when you talk about that over-the-top threat, I think about what Will Fuller did for the Texans and how much better that made DeAndre Hopkins. Again, not a guy who needed any help. Not by any stretch. But you know, defense has just had to force that over-the-top speed that Fuller played with. So safeties took steps back. Opens up the middle of the field. And in this case, Scott could have that same effect. And then you're giving that much more room for Drake Lund and, and Kyle Pitts to work with, which again, I think those guys were first rounders, top 10 picks for good reason. They don't need any help, but Tyler Scott can certainly give them that help. Next is doing on a 76. I'm going to give him uh, Blake Freeland. We haven't gone off at the tackle yet. I do think they could use a guy to develop long term. Right now, like Trent Brown, I don't think that's a long term answer, and I certainly don't think Riley Reef is. I do think those guys could start right away. But in this situation, I think you draft Blake Freeland, you move Trent Brown over to right tackle, and then Riley Reef just becomes this contingency swing tackle. And then, uh, you know, honestly, I think Freeland and then Brown, that could be your tackle tandem, not only this year, but next year. It depends on what Brown looks like this year. Uh, I think flipping him back to right tackle is probably good for him, having a little bit more longevity. But uh, they need to start her now, and they need to figure out an answer long term. So this made all the sense in the world, and I like Freeland just a little bit more than Duncan and Wanya Morris and some of the other names available here in the mid-70s. Then we get back to the Los Angeles Rams. If you saw my defensive fits video, you're not going to be surprised by this pick. Garrett Williams, you know, man coverage upside, both with his feet and his athleticism and the frame and it just the arm. You know, he's got all these traits that say this guy should be playing a lot of man coverage. But Syracuse is a zone heavy team. So why not put him in a cover four heavy defense like Raheem Morris's in Los Angeles, where he is technically playing zone, but it's basically just off man coverage. Feels like the perfect blend of his two worlds coming together. And the Rams, after trading Jalen Ramsey, have legitimately no answers there on the outside. So Garrett Williams, high upside play here. Yes, it's coming off the injury. So you worry about, hey, is he going to be the same athlete after that? I, I think ACL injuries have gotten to the point where we understand how to properly diagnose um, correct in the surgery process and then rehab it to where that athlete gets back to 100% and in some cases even better. So I'm not really worried about the athleticism for Garrett Williams. I think he gives them potential CB1 of the future and really good value here at 77. Next up is the Green Bay Packers and I'm going to give them Jartavius Martin. I'm going to make the same argument that I made uh, last week with a small twist on it. So last week I had Jartavius Martin or Quan Martin actually now um, going to New England and I was like, hey, maybe he could be that Devin McCourty replacement. 
here I'm like, hey, Adrian Amos is still in the market. You know, who's that free safety? Dartavis Martin played almost 180 snaps over the top. Maybe he could be that. He's got crazy long speed, but also twitchy first step uh, explosiveness. So, you know, that change of direction skill set and ability to go see the ball once the pass is in the air, go make a play on it, go make a break on it. I think he's got that. But also, Rasul Douglas is a very cuttable contract. Maybe not this year, but I mean, he does this year. You save like six and a half, seven million this year. But next year, you'd save a little more than nine. So, Jartavius Martin, who played the nickel primarily, nickel strong safety hybrid at Illinois. He could also just be Rasul Douglas replacement. So I think this pick, it's it's hard for me to imagine Quan Martin not getting on the field, whether it says free safety as an Adrian Amos replacement or as a way to save money and move on from Rasul Douglas, who's been good in that role. But the salary cap, you know, eventually got to start playing that game. Um, and who knows, Jordan Love might be really good. Maybe you have to start paying him. I mean, who knows what's going to happen after this year in Green Bay. But I think Jartavius Martin allows you to either move on from Douglas or gives you that Adrian Amos replacement. So it feels like you're just drafting a starter. And anytime you do that in the third round, you should be excited about it. Colts pick at 79. I'm going to give him Byron Young. I'm going to go ahead and put out, uh, I don't know how, how hot of a take this is uh, per se, but um, you know, if there is a, a player that's going to surprise me that goes round one, like who's going to be Cole Strange this year, I think it's going to be Byron Young from Tennessee. And now for some other people, they're like, hey, I like Byron Young. He should go round one. Like, And that's cool. My opinion is more so like, hey, I kind of like a mid-ish mid late ish, you know, day two, uh, kind of like where I have him here. And that's where he tends to go in my mocks. Um, but I could see a team saying, Hey, well, you know, he's older, he's experienced, he's, you know, battle tested and he's got crazy athleticism or I'll take a shot on him. Uh, he could kind of be this year's Cole strange. So Byron Young's my bet for that. If we get that this year. Um, but for Indianapolis, yes, you sign uh, Samson Ibukam, and that was one of my favorite contracts of the offseason, no doubt about it. Uh, but Quiddy pay really hasn't taken that step forward as a pass rusher. Um, and Ibukam, Primarily been a run stopper, you know, in San Francisco and a little bit of moments uh, as a pass rusher. He's not bad in that realm, uh, but he's not a, you know, take this game over type of guy either. And I'm not sure Byron Young is either, but at least he has like 90th percentile broad jump, runs a 4-4-3. You have like the, that athleticism that says he could be, maybe. Um, and I also think a three-man trio, which, you know, I've harked on this so much of this video where like having that trio is is big. You need three guys who can rush the passer. And I think Byron Young is that third fiddle behind Ibukam and uh, Quiddy Pay is, is just healthy for that defense. And, you know, injuries are come to arise. So minimum Byron Young can be that depth. Next, Pittsburgh at pick 80. I'm going to give him uh, Jamie Robinson. Uh, whether he's playing the nickel over Arthur, Arthur Millett, ooh, I would love to see that because I think they could definitely get better there. Or if he's just playing like strong safety uh, over someone like a Demonte KZ or Keanu Neal, who both those guys come with injury concerns. Uh, Demonte KZ played pretty good for Pittsburgh when we got to see him last year, so I'm, I'm actually kind of excited for that. Unless him and Neal both battled a ton of injuries, and you know we've seen flashes, but has it been con continued, sustained, long-term success? No, it hasn't. So I think drafting a potential starter here in Jamie Robinson, whether it's at strong safety or nickel, is just good here. And I think having that flexibility is also big, just like we talked about with Quan Martin. Next, New England, back on the clock here at 81. This was from the trade down with uh, Detroit uh, back in the first round video. And here at 81, I'm going to give him Jordan Battle. So we get to go wide receiver, tight end, off the tackle. Now we're going to address the defensive side of the ball. Just give him a sound, instinctive, high IQ football player, Jordan Battle. His athletic numbers, just like Jamie Robinson and some of the other safeties, kind of worried me a little bit. But I'm going to trust the tape, and I'm going to trust that also the 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 – familiarity between the Alabama defense and the and the New England defense, you know, comes into play here and it makes it that much easier for Jordan Battle to get on the field. I don't know if he has the athletic traits to play free safety. I really don't. And they already kind of have a ton of these guys who can play strong, you know, Kyle Duggar, Jabril Peppers, and Jalen Mills, maybe even moving into that role. So it's like, man, it's kind of feels like a loaded, strong safety room. So I don't love it from that standpoint. Uh, but maybe one of those guys can move up top to free. I actually really like Duggar and his athleticism. So maybe you get that feel for coverage and, you know, he could be that over the top playmaker. But I think Jordan Battle just kind of shores up that safety spot. And I, I have a hard time imagining Battle not being uh, a safety for a majority of next season if this were to be the pick. And, of course, that would also be contingent on the trade down uh, from the first round. Next, Tampa Bay at pick 82. I'm going to go Clark Phillips here. Kind of the same stuff I was talking about with some of the other guys earlier. But to me, this is just as seamless a Sean Murphy bunting replacement and potential upgrade as Tampa Bay could get this year. You plug Clark Phillips the third into the nickel. And again, 70, 80% of your snaps are going to be played in the nickel. Like you're, you're going to be, that's nickel's the new base. So having that third corner is paramount. And I think Clark Phillips, one of the best defensive players from one of the best defensive teams in college football last year, sticking coverage. The only reason he's not playing on the outside is because he has sub 30 inch arms. And to me, that's a hard cutoff. I'm not a huge, like you got to be this threshold. You got to be that, but arm length for corners, 
to me, that does differentiate between outside guys and slot only. Phillips, unfortunately, slot only in my books. Uh, and again, Sean Murphy Bunting started out his career really, really good. His rookie season was the best that he's played so far. But then slowly kind of just kind of took a step back in his play and just kind of went in the wrong direction. I think Clark Phillips could ultimately in that, you know, in turn be an upgrade there. Uh, and then you're talking about Jamel Dean, Carlton Davis, and Clark Phillips. That's an awesome trio. We added edge in the second round. That defense is kind of getting back to where it was when it won the Super Bowl. Let me get to Seattle at 83. I'm going to get Moro Ojomo. This is one of my favorite players in this class. If you saw my My Guys video, yeah, you already know that. Um, and I think you could have a rotation of him and Jaron Reed. Uh, Ojomo kind of playing the early down stuff. Reed maybe kicking in uh, and being the guy on the passing down stuff. I can see that nice uh, relationship. Ojomo is just, I think, an NFL-ready run stopper, which is also big because when you sign a Draymond Jones, who is a really good pass rusher but leaves a lot to be desired in run defense, that becomes paramount. So Ojomo could keep Draymond Jones clean. And also, I think Jaron Reed is just not that good anymore. Sorry, Seahawks fans. I know he's been a you know, longtime Seahawk and a you know, fan favorite, but I just don't think he's all that good anymore. Um, so I'd just love to see Ojomo get the passing down work too and just be the starter over Jaron Reed. But I could see where Ojomo does the, the rundown stuff. You, you sprinkle in Jaron Reed for those pass situations because he does have you know kind of that prowess. And that's still part of the game where I do think he can contribute a little bit. Um, but yeah, just addressing defensive lines, something we haven't done yet in this draft for Seattle. Uh, especially the run reinforcements, I think that's big because there were stretches, I want to say like weeks 12 through 16, where it was like, damn, man, Seattle's run game is just absolutely brutal, and it might keep them out of the playoffs. Now, you know, they kind of corrected things, got back on track with wins in week 17 and week 18, but there was a stretch there where I was like, dude, they have got to clean that up, and I think Ojomo brings a lot in that department. Then we get to Miami at 84, and, you know, I've been going kind of tackle and tight end pretty much this whole cycle for Miami, so why buck that trend here? Jalen Duncan athleticism that says, hey, this guy should be a first rounder and has the size to go with it as well. Uh, he just needs to start playing like it. Uh, so he may be a little bit of a work in progress. No guarantee Jalen Duncan immediately is better than Austin Jackson or is immediately better than Brandon Shell, but he could be long term. And who knows? I mean, <laughs> we might get into the camp battle and prove that he already is better. Uh, but I also think with his athleticism, makes for a really good fit in that zone blocking scheme. Plays with good strength so he can sit and anchor and hold up in pass pro. Uh, yeah, he just needs to get better in a lot of different ways with his feet, with his hands. I mean, there's just a lot of refinement to be done there um, but if they do that refining they're gonna have a really awesome right tackle and that's the one missing weak link on that offensive line right now in Miami and Jalen Duncan has the potential to fill that next we're gonna get to the Los Angeles Chargers at 85 and as promised all the way back in the round one video I'm gonna give you your speed wide receiver how does 438 sound that's what Marvin Mim, Marvin Mims runs, and you know that's compared to you know four four nine at a pro day Mike Williams, which really is four five something, four five two Josh Palmer, and then you know, Keenan Allen, who's four seven, who I think played faster than that at one point, but maybe not so much anymore. This is the speed that they just don't have right now. And I think this also showcases where I want the Chargers to draft Zay Flowers at twenty one like no other, uh, and I wanted them to get Jamison Williams last year and just didn't get the opportunity. You could also wait. This is a class with a lot of speed and a lot of slider built guys that, you know, because of that, they're going to be there day two. You know, you could get Jalen Hyatt, maybe if he falls enough, you know, uh, you know, Tyler Scott could be here round three. You know, there's a lot of different avenues and possibilities here. Um, so for the Chargers to get a Marvin Mims to be that speed threat in the offense they don't have, but also future slot receiver replacement for Keenan Allen, I think this is a fantastic value here at 85. And hey, if you saw my My Guys videos, uh, you know, I love me some Marvin Mims. Next, Baltimore at 86. You know, Eli Ricks comes with some some potential risks here. The 40 was, I, I knew he wasn't fast, but even the 40 and the three cone, I was like, okay, that's that could be a potential problem. But I'm just going to trust the tape here and say, hey, man, at LSU and Alabama, which that alone, I think, speaks volumes. Those are two of the three DBUs in contention, right? You, this guy just had a grad year at Ohio State, then I'd be fully in. But, uh, you know, I think that type of portfolio going to LSU than Alabama speaks. And when you got to see him play, like this guy is man press upside for days. So I think pairing him up with Marlon Humphrey could create a really awesome duo where maybe the athleticism concerns kind of come into play is like, what does he look like in zone coverage, which Mike McDonald, the Ravens DC sprinkled in more than what they did in years past with Wink Martindale. So maybe a little bit of a concern there, but they just got to address this spot. And here at 86, I think it's worth taking the, the gamble, rolling the dice here for the upside that Eli Ricks plays with. Because when you see him, at the college level, he's awesome. Like, he's rarely not a very good player when he's on the field. It's just a little slow to get on the field with, you know, learning a new playbook at Alabama. Also, had some injury concerns. So, there are some other potential uh, flags, uh, red flags, that is, in the mix. Minnesota at 87. I'm going to have them take Tanner McKee. It's been a while since I had Tanner McKee in any of these videos. But, 
hey, look, we went wide receiver, we went corner. To me, those standing out as major pressing needs. Easily could have gone defensive line here. I don't hate Siaki Ika. Jaqueline Roy could be fun. The other Byron Young or even Zach Pickens, for that matter. But I decided I want to go in the route of a potential Kirk Cousins replacement. I think Tanner McKee has kind of that, a lot of those same stuff. You know, he's not the most mobile, but I actually think he's more mobile than Kirk. Uh, big frame, strong arm, not the biggest arm, but it's it's strong enough to play at the next level. Accurate, I think one of the more underrated passers in this year's class when it comes from an accuracy standpoint. Uh, and he's just coming from a terrible situation in Stanford. Bad offensive line, bad wide receivers, coaching scheme and an offensive scheme that was just stale. It's a lot of what Will Levis had to deal with at Kentucky. So because of that, I'm buying on the traits and the tools that are there and saying, hey, you put a better team around them and you put a better scheme around them, they'll be better. And hey, he'd be going from that bad situation in Stanford to Minnesota where you had Justin Jefferson. We drafted a wide receiver in yesterday's video. Uh, you'd have Kevin O'Connell and his scheme coming over from the Rams that looked really, really good last year. That feels like a spot where Tanner McKee is going to look a whole lot better. So I'm intrigued by this, especially if Minnesota can accumulate more picks to address wide receiver and corner. I think that frees them up to do, uh, you know, or take a quarterback here uh, late round three. Jags then on the clock at 88. I'm going to go Yaya Diaby. Uh, this guy is just a super explosive. If you look at his like mock draftables, like damn near off the charts in the 40, the 10 yard split, the broad jump. Yeah, twitch dump athlete. Not the biggest guy, 253 pounds, but uh, because of that, I think he's kind of a perfect Arden Key replacement. Maybe that buys him some time as that third pass rusher to bulk up just a little bit more. But you can move him across the defensive line, and his explosiveness, it's you're, its undeniable. Like, you, you see it immediately when you watch him. Um, and then you throw him in a rotation with Josh Allen and Trayvon Walker. That's a pass rush trio with some serious juice to it. And you're talking about Trayvon Walker going into year two. You already know what Josh Allen is. Like, the explosiveness Diaby into the mix there. That's really, really fun. And I think the Jags right now would be my pick to win the AFC South. So I figure on them winning a lot of games. So therefore, that extra pass rush uh, depth comes in handy. And then here at 89, I did want to note, I really wanted to make like a player trade, but Mock Draft Database doesn't let you do that. So I was going to offer a three and a five to the Cardinals and have the Giants get DeAndre Hopkins. Uh, but because I can't do that, and I can't even finesse it and like put a picture up here instead and then you know manipulate the, the, the picks for picks swap of this. For whatever reason, the pick for pick swaps just don't work for some reason when it's a second rounder and nothing that close coming back to it. I don't know. It's a little wonky. But nevertheless, I really did want to go wide receiver and make it a trade for DeAndre Hopkins, get the Cardinals back on the clock and explore what they could do here. But instead, I'm going to go with Jonathan Mingo. Guy with a little bit more size and weight than the guys they have right now. Has the yak upside. I think could eat up over the middle of the field where Daniel Jones targets the field a lot. Um, but also, I think route running that when you see it, yeah, that looks like it could win at all three levels. And he's got the ability to stack corners and be a big play threat. So I think he kind of gives them that full, well-rounded skill set they're kind of missing uh, and a little bit more mass and size versus the guys they already have. Next, Tampa Bay at pick 90. I'm going to give him Dwayne McBride here. Uh, I talked about him a little bit at the end of last week's video, but as productive a running back there was in college football the last three years and one of the highest graded running backs of the last three seasons using PFF's numbers. Um, but a guy who wins with power and short area burst and explosiveness may not always break off you know big games, but his chunk plays are like 10 to 20 yards. I think that's more than enough. And you throw him in a rotation in a committee with Rashad White, you know, McBride's kind of that, you know, chunk power, you know, short air explosiveness guy. And then Rashad White's your prototypical elusive scat back. That feels like a nice one-two punch on paper. And I think McBride ultimately is going to go somewhere in the top 100. He's getting a lot of hype right about now. Then we get to Buffalo at 91. I'm going to go with Ronnie Hickman coming off a career year at Ohio State. Uh, a very flexible, versatile guy who played both safety spots as well as nickel. So whether it's filling in for Teron Johnson or, you know, Micah Hyde gets hurt or um, Jordan Poyer misses time, whatever ends up happening, I think Ronnie Hickman could be a, a potential starter both at nickel or those other safety spots. And I know DeMar Hamlin is coming back. And that's really fun. That's a great story. And I'm really fascinated to see how that plays out. But okay, that's Hamlin plus who, uh, you know, once this Poyer Hyde uh, tenure ends in Buffalo. So Hickman could be that other guy basically with Tamar Hamlin. I also know Christian Benford's there. You could do that. And again, Teron Johnson, you could find an upgrade there. So basically all this to say, like, no matter what argument you come at me with for Ronnie Hickman and why this should be the pick, I'm going to tell you there's eventually an avenue in two years' time where Ronnie Hickman's a starter for the Buffalo Bills. So drafting a starter here in the third round, again, you should never be upset about that. Cincinnati at 92 as we begin to wind down. I'm going to give him Luke Musgrave. He lingered on the board more than I would have liked, but hey, Cincinnati, you get a awesome athletic tight end here in the 90s to be that potential uh, upgrade to the position that you're looking for, but also a guy who can work the middle of the field, has solid route running, good hands, uh, some yak ability given the athleticism. 
uh, yeah, I think that's a pretty awesome potential Tyler Boyd replacement for that over the field production that you're going to lose when he becomes a free agent in another year's time. Uh, yeah, and like I said, they, they can already stand to find an upgrade there. They can get more athletic at the position. Luke Musgrave definitely brings that to the table. Carolina then at 93. I typically go Zach Harrison here, but I wanted to change it up just a little bit. And instead, I'm going to go Andre Carter the second. Uh, different big body frame. And where I think this is an interesting pairing is, you know, Carter at 6'6", 260. Uh, you know, he's got fluctuating weight uh, and army. And because of that, it kind of feels like th- th- there's inconsistency in his power profile. I think that'll get even down at the NFL level where, you know, football becomes his job and that's his sole focus. Uh, but then that 6'9", 7'3", cone. And you already have one of the bendiest, maybe the bendiest edge rusher in football on the other side of Brian Burns. So to then add another big body, massive guy who, in theory, with that frame, should stop the run at a higher level than Brian Burns does, but also has that sneaky bend ability. Okay, like that feels like a really interesting fit to that defense. But whoever it ends up being, Carolina stands to add one more edge rusher. Unfortunately, Yutur Gross Matos, who I did like out of Penn State as a second rounder, um, he hasn't worked out. So take another swing of the bat here, trying to find some help for Brian Burns, I think makes a lot of sense here in the 90s. Then we get to Philadelphia. I'm going to give him Jaden Reed. I mean, this kind of feels like Quez Watkins, who's slightly slower, but better at everything else. In a 4 4 4 40, let's not act like that's slow, folks. Like, that is moving. And he may not be a Quez Watkins fast, but a better route runner. Uh, I think more dynamic with the ball in his hands. I think Quez Watkins is faster with the ball in his hands, but. I don't know. He does have some receiving and some returning upside. So you could convince the other way. But I also think Jaden Reed could be an awesome special teamer and return specialist. So um, maybe they're about even the yards after the catch ability. But who is the more refined route runner here? Who is more likely to get open over the intermediate parts of the field? Who is more likely to get open deep down the field other than just running past someone? All the answers to that is Jaden Reed. He is the more palace receiver. Uh, and because of that, you're talking about an offense that, one, is now paying Jalen Hurts. So wherever you can save money is paramount. But then A.J. Brown... Devonta Smith, and then you add a more crisp right runner in the slot, Jaden Reed. Ah, man, that is really fun to think about for that Philly offense. So I love the value there of Reed at 94. Kansas City then at 95. I'm going to go Tucker Craft. I'd be really curious to see if they add some two-receiver set. This also easily could have been the next guy that's going to come off the board here in just one moment. Um... But nevertheless, if you run some two tight end sets, create some mismatches against linebackers, Kraft, really good athlete, uh, and working with Travis Kelsey, that should you know kind of bring him along where I'm a little concerned about him dominating lower level competition. Partner up with Travis Kelsey. All right, I feel like there's going to be some coaching and a mentor-mentee relationship to where he'll he'll become ready to go at the NFL level. Uh, and those two tight end sets would be an absolute nightmare for opposing defenses. And then also you have a guy waiting in the wings to be that Travis Kelsey replacement. Not saying Tucker Kraft's going to be as good as Travis Kelsey, but if you take him now, you let him work with Kelsey, you let him develop with one another, one Kelsey does hang it up, you feel pretty decent that that guy can at least be some big portion of the percentage that is left with future Hall of Famer Travis Kelsey eventually retiring. Then we get to Arizona. And again, this very easily could have been the pick for the Kansas City Chiefs. But I'm going to go Rasheed Rice. Again, I was trying to have the the trade go through for the Giants uh, at 89 to where they get DeAndre Hopkins. So I was like, okay, well, now Arizona needs wide receiver. Rasheed Rice would be a really interesting add. And let's just just say that did play out, you know, ultimately. Uh, Then you could make this Jonathan Mingo. And I'd be even more intrigued by it versus Rasheed Rice. But um, if Arizona moves on from DeAndre Hopkins, I'm looking at small, slightly built, but really twitchy with the ball in his hands, Rondell Moore. And then Hollywood Brown, kind of the same thing. And I'm like, they need someone with a little bit of mass. You know, Rasheed Rice doesn't play as big as Cedric Tillman, but they both kind of want to play the same game, which makes this a little weird to compare the two. Uh, That's why Tillman ultimately has kind of surpassed Rasheed Rice pretty comfortably in my wide receiver rankings. But Rice, even at six foot, at at 200 pounds, plays with like a Velcro strip to a defender and he loves playing through contact. He just embraces that physicality and wants to make every catch a contested catch. Now it's a bad thing because it's like, hey, sometimes you're just open and that's a good thing. Uh, but then there's some times where it's like, hey, sometimes you just got to make those tough catches. And Rasheed Rice is very good at that. And we saw that some in the Maryland game against Deontay Banks and some of the other corners. It wasn't always just Banks and Rice, but we saw it a little bit in that contest where, yeah, it's like, dude, to get some good competition, you can body fools, uh, which is good to see for a guy at SMU. So it's good to see him playing up against some of those higher level schools that they did go toe to toe against. So this could be your potential contested catch replacement here for DeAndre Hopkins. But you know, again, if, if it really could have played out the best way possible, 
I would have had you know a picture pop up on the screen, Photoshop with DeAndre Hopkins in a Jets or Giants jersey, and we're talking about oh DeAndre Hopkins is a Giant, that's great. And then the Cardinals would be picking Jonathan Mingo here, who I would have ranked higher than Rasheed Rice. But nevertheless, even the way it played out, I don't hate it whatsoever. Let me get Washington at ninety-seven. I've been adding these speedy zone coverage specialists to replace Cole Holcomb, and primarily it's been Dorian Williams here. Let's change it up and give him the safety converted to linebacker to Marvin Overshone, another one of my guys just from the linebacker spot, my off-ball linebacker number five. Cleaned up his tackling last year, uh, and I think at 6'3", 230, you're not getting the super small, light, really problematic run game fits that defense that some of the other linebackers uh, potentially are. Uh, so with a little bit more mass, I feel comfortable with Overshone playing three downs. And then him plus Shaman Davis, yeah, that's a lot of raw potential, but the potential is undeniable for that tandem. And, and uh, if Jamin Davis takes a step forward, if Overshone figures it out, that is going to be a really fun tandem to watch, and they're going to cover a ton of ground over the middle of the field. And, you know, in theory, if there's a place for Overshone to grow as a linebacker, how about the place where their head coach is a former linebacker and their DC is a former linebacker? Feels like Washington could be a good spot there for Overshone. For Cleveland, I'm giving Siaki Ika. Sticking with this pick, I would love to see him and uh, Dalvin Tomlinson team up. Two 330-plus pound guys stuffed in the middle of the field, eating up space, eating up blocks, and improving that run defense. And it's kind of the same thing we talked about with Keon White with the last pick for Cleveland, where it's like, that has been a problem spot for so long, so I kind of want to make my emphasis here for Cleveland with these two picks. Let's find some run-stopping reinforcements, and that I feel like we have done. And then Ika with that sneaky pass rush upside, with that spin move, the finesse to go with Dalvin Tomlinson, who's an underrated pass rusher. All of a sudden, you're looking at this defensive line, and it's like, all right, well, it's Keon White, Ogbo, and Karankwo on the end, Miles Garrett, one of the game's best. And then in the middle of those guys, Tomlinson, who you can't overlook as a pass rusher, Ika, who has some upside there. Okay, did the Browns' defensive line in one draft with two picks transform the pass rush ability and, and the workload that they need out of Miles Garrett with one day's worth of work? I think they kind of have. Uh, and it makes that defense that much better. And if they had a full defensive line, bringing production, not just Miles Garrett. I think this team would have made the playoffs last year, maybe even the year, uh, or been a lot more scary when they did make the playoffs with Baker Mayfield. Was that two years ago or three years ago? But nevertheless, this has been a spot where we've been trying to see Cleveland make some strides in the right direction. I think Keon White, Siaki Ika, some upside plays there that could certainly get them to where they're trying to go. All right, now we get to our final five picks. At 99, I'm going to have uh, San Francisco... Jeff Wanya Morris, uh, potential starting right tackle, good movement skills, former five-star recruit, also has the frame to start. And the reason I picked him here at 99 is because, you know, maybe the Raiders are looking at him here at 100. So just trying to find that Mike McGlinchey replacement. And Wanya Morris, boom, bust play here. But the boom is, okay, cool. Yeah, we definitely replaced Mike McGlinchey. And the bust is like, okay, well, he was no worse than anybody we already had on roster. So I, I think he's worth taking the risk on there at 99. He might even go before that just because of that recruiting profile, the athleticism, the frame. Like, there's so many traits there that I could see him being a surprise pick that goes before this. At 100, now we get the Raiders just kind of uh, butting in uh, with all these uh, 49ers picks. I'm going to give him Andrew Voorhees, another guy that lasted way too long on the board here. But Voorhees, you know, maybe it's a draft and stash, but I, I would say probably midway through his rookie year, I feel confident with saying he's going to be starting for them. Uh, we'll have to see what the timetable is for that ACL injury, but I feel like by November, December, he could be playing. Uh, again, we'll have to see what the timeline is. And if he is playing... You plug him in at left guard, Dylan Parra moves over to right guard, and Jermaine Illuminor plays right tackle. Or if you feel like Brandon Parker has earned a spot uh, at the right tackle position, okay, all right, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, we'll have Voorhees play left guard, we'll play Dylan Parra at center, and it'll be uh, Luminor at right guard and Parker at right tackle. So you got options here, and basically the conversation comes down to who is the weaker link, Andre James at center or Brandon Parker at right tackle? And to me, that would probably be Brandon Parker at right tackle. So I'd probably go with the first scenario that I rolled out, but just patching up that interior offensive line that much more, um, you know, trying to make it the best situation possible for Jimmy Garoppolo and Anthony Richardson, who he drafted at seven, as well as for Josh Jacobs, who was playing under the franchise tag. Two more picks for San Francisco. Uh, I'm going to go Jacorian Bennett. You know, I've been going Trey uh, Tomlinson here a lot, but one to sprinkle in a different name. Jacorian Bennett is an insane athlete who also sticky in man coverage. Uh, you know, as much as talk about Deontay Banks always been at the catch point, Jacorian Bennett, uh, Jacorian Bennett uh, does not. Uh, does not lose strides or lose one-on-one -on -one matchups with wide receivers often. Like, this guy is as sticky as it gets from the nickel. Uh, now, he's nickel only, but good news for San Francisco. Jimmy Ward is gone, and uh, you know, Jacorian Bennett can just step into a starting spot in that same position. And also, I want to note, year over year, that run defense grade using PFF's numbers has gotten better and better, and the t missed tackle percentage has gone down steadily over each of the last three years at Maryland. So you're getting a guy who's getting more and more comfortable against the run, which is also paramount for that slot 
corner role. And then at 102, I'm going to give him Juice Scruggs, a guy that I don't think I've had in any of my mocks. And I like Juice Scruggs. He's just on this fringe of like end of round three, early round four. And since I don't do four rounds mocks, you know, I don't always get to talk about him. But a guy who looked pretty good at the combine, not only testing wise, but with the drills, just look fluid, look smooth. Uh, and I think for that zone blocking scheme, he's an awesome fit. And he's a guy who's played right guard, left guard, and center. So no matter what happens with Aaron Banks and uh, um, some of the other guys there on the off the line whose name's now escaping me, but all the, and Brendel's there at center. Now I'm forgetting the right guard. But nevertheless, you understand the point. Whatever it does end up happening with that inter offensive line, whether guys just don't take a step forward, don't get any better, Juice Scruggs could step in and be a starter. Or if injuries happen, you have a guy waiting the wings who's a great scheme fit uh, and can immediately plug and play and give you some value there. So, But I'm mostly drafting Juice Scruggs here, trying to find a way for him to become a starter, probably for Aaron Banks. That sucks to say as a Notre Dame fan, but I just didn't see Banks as a good fit for his zone blocking scheme in general. So maybe they trade Banks, they could start Scruggs here, and I feel confident with him as your left guard. Then we get to the Bears here at 103. Last pick we're going to talk about. I'm going to go ahead and double down at edge. Yes, we drafted B.J. Ojolari, but let's draft a guy with a completely different frame uh, in Zach Harrison. Uh, six foot five and a half, 270, which is, again, drastically different versus six foot two, 248 B.J. Ojolari. Uh, but I think it's a good thing, right? Like, Chicago... Really, I don't think they have any answers there on the defensive line right now. Like, I don't feel confident with anybody they have in the edge group. Uh, so taking a couple swings of the bat inside the top one of the three, I don't think is a bad thing. And different bodies, let's see what sticks, you know. Uh, let's throw different things against the wall, and whatever sticks, that's your starter. There you go. Uh, so, yeah, like Zach Harrison, and who knows, like, you know, in the best case scenario, Zach Harrison hits and B.J. Ojolari hits. And that becomes a really nice one-two punch because they went in different ways. You know, Harrison with his frame, his athleticism, straight line speed and power. And then Ojolari with kind of finesse and a full move set and good hand placement. So it could be fun to think about there if you're a Bears fan. But all that to buy me some time and show you this full three-round mock one final time. Let me hear your thoughts down below in the comment section. What would you think of the third-round pick I gave your favorite squad? As well as what would you think of the three-round hole I gave your favorite team? I'd love to hear your thoughts, whether you loved it, hated it, or or somewhere there in between, let me hear your feedback down below in the comments section. But hopefully you guys enjoyed. Be sure to hit that like button if you did. Seriously, it would help out me and this video a ton. And subscribe if you're new, looking for more football content. And if you want to join us for day one and day two of the NFL Draft, in which we will be live. And definitely, of course, go back and check out our sponsor, BetUS. All their information is down below in the description. But guys, that is going to do it for me. Hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day. And until next time, my name is Teach, and I am signing off.